Hi, everyone. Welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. I am delighted on this episode to be talking with a creator whose work I absolutely adore, and that is Sophia Glock. Sophia, thank you for joining me for a brief talk. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Jason. I'm very happy to be here. It is my pleasure. It's my pleasure. I'll mention a couple of titles, as I do on pretty much every episode of this thing. Uh, Passport is the one that is probably out there the most. I know recently I've written about Passport in uh, an article that I'm pitching to a language journal, so I'll mention a little bit more about that as we go through. You also have The Deformatory that is mm -hmm. out there as well. And your work has been in the New York Times, BuzzFeed, The New Yorker, and several other venues. So you you are a person who has created widely and whose work is out in the world. It is. It's weird. It is out in the world. Um, yeah. And Passport, it's always funny. People are always like, is this your first book? And I never really know what to say because my background <laughs> is indie mm -hmm. comics. My Yes, but I have like 10 years worth of like tiny books that I self-published that no one read. So thank you for mentioning my indie efforts as well. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And, <laughs> and they are not that hard to find in, in the world of Google and the internet and websites. Uh, not not hard to locate at all, at all. Um, what, what initially connected you with writing and creating? Um, yeah, I love this question because it's usually it's like, when did you start writing comics or whatever. But like, you know, I mean, I was always just very into stories. All people are, all, most of the kids are, but I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be um, one of the people who told stories. Mm -hmm. um, I was a very, I was very fairy tale oriented kid as well. And then comics came later. I mean, I read comics the way that we all read comics. They were in my newspapers. Um, I read a lot of Archie. I read a lot of Mad. Um, but it wasn't something that I ever conceived of being a part of until I discovered X-Men comics when I was around 12 years old. And then I was like, oh, no, it's not just it's not just I don't just want to be a writer. I want to write these things. Um, and that's, you know, those, those were my kind of early connections just from like, I was an avid, I was a huge reader as a kid. Um, that was a big part of it. And I did, I thought I was like, well, I'm going to write books. I'm going to write novels. I'm going to write these epic fantasy novels. So that's what I thought was going to be the thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but a few things clicked together, including the fact that I couldn't stop drawing. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that was a, a part of it, the visual element when that clicked into place, I kind of understood what I really wanted. Yeah, it really is. It's a collision of so many ways of storytelling. That's that's part of what I love about it. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, you've had tipped some of your indie experiences, so I'm curious about some of what's been positive in your experiences, some of those moments that have uh, kind of bubbled up as you've worked in, in developing this career. Um. Yeah, I... It's interesting. Um, I guess like the first incredibly positive thing that happened to me and it sort of led to all other good things. I, the deformatory specifically was, I did, um, I did go to graduate school for illustration in a program that I rightfully sensed was comics friendly, mm -hmm. um, uh, at SVA. And I came out of it not, you know, I really not knowing. <laughs> Part of me, I was thinking about this the other day. I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't be an editorial cartoon, like an editorial illustrator, <laughs> like if you paid me and nobody would. But like, I just like, I'm like, I'm not, like I really never was meant to do that kind of thing. But I, so I basically focused entirely on comics. Um, and my graduate thesis was uh, the deformatory, which was like 50 page little comic. And I applied for Xeric and it felt like such a long shot. It really, I mean, I wanted it. Gosh, I wanted it more than anything, but it did feel like, you know, what are the chances? I was like, yeah, if I don't get it this year, maybe I'll get it. Like I'll try next year. I'll try a few years from now kind of thing. And I got the Xeric for the deformatory. Uh -huh. Always told myself, you know, back then, even I was like, I lowballed them. I asked for very little money. Of course they had to give it to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, um, they'd be losing money not to give me the Zarek award, but it basically was like this 
all these little doors opens when I won the Zarek. And I think that it, and I, and I mourn the fact that it doesn't exist because for me, I don't think it's, it's hard to imagine my way into the indie comic scene had I not had that like kind of stamp of approval, you know, mm-hmm. right off the mm-hmm. bat. You know, I'd been to MoCA once before I got the Zarek. And then the, so the, my second year of MoCA, I had a Zarek book and it, it felt great. I mean, nothing felt better. Like people were like, whoa, Zarek. Like it was immediately this sort of, it's not, it didn't make people like your book more. It made you people pick your book up though. Yeah, and, yeah. and that was wonderful. And, and it led to me sort of confidently um, yeah, having the cash, having the literal cash to, you know, get a table at shows, go to SBX. And, and that basically those experiences made me meet everybody who's been like relevant in my artistic life and even if those are just people who know what it means to live this life and try and make this thing and be obsessed with this medium Mm -hmm. um those people have been so important to me and that was all through you know that's all through shows and you know it's been one of the more gratifying sort of you know like learning how to ride that circuit and i don't really do it so much anymore but um that was that was a wonderful that was a wonderful time that was one of my more positive experiences yeah, yeah. Isn't it amazing how we talk ourselves out of our success? Like they had to give it to me. They they didn't. <laughs> yeah. They didn't though. They didn't know. That's that's an accomplishment <laughs> in your favor. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I I don't yeah, I've I've dropped that negative self-talk line <laughs> yes, from the absolutely. story of myself. I'm like, no, I want that. I want it. You know? That's right. That's right. I did that. I did that. I did absolutely. that. Absolutely. <laughs> So, so as far as creating, I'm thinking about an image in, in Passport where you're talking about kind of immersion in language. And it's one, it's one of those things that I pulled out for the writing that I was talking about doing. Um, and you kind of have this image of you and you're being buried in uh, languages, which I, I just love the way that visual comes together. So that kind of leads me to the question of what comics allow you to do in the stories that you want to tell. Yeah, that was one of more my more sort of inventive and like I I still love that, you know, um that solution to you know, and it's it, it it's a perfect comics, right? Because it's like I used the text as um as a visual element itself, as it like, you know, as a story building block in those moments. Right. That's actually, you know, that's a good one where I really played with, um, you know, type more than anything. When I, one of the things I really like about comics, um, you know, that type of abstraction that, that was very fun. I do enjoy, it's one of my, the, my favorite thing is like the way comics can actually play with time in a way that other mediums, simply cannot Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i and i did and the i had this one more like little breakthrough the other day about what makes comics different from a novel and obviously a thousand things but like one of them is time but i've known that for a really long time you can really control the amount of time that a reader spends on any given page you can move them through the pages quickly you can force them to turn the pages quickly obviously the ultimately the reader is in control but like and you can also force them to stay on a panel or stay on a page and work through a million tiny panels or just give them a splash or whatever. Right. So I do enjoy that manipulation of time that is very static throughout the novel or even fairly static through film. And the thing that like a comic can do though, that a novel can't is like turn off the noise. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can turn the noise off, you know, or you can make it really loud. You, you can have sound to abstracts. I like the idea of sound, but you can't force your reader to sit in silence, like brain silence in the way that like a comic can, you know, you always have to be describing, describing, giving more and more and more, Mm -hmm. but in a comic, you can take it away. You know, you can do three black pages even. I mean, I wouldn't, but you know, I don't know. And uh, I do, I mean, it's just such a playful, infinitely plastic medium. And I don't even think that I, I don't even think, I don't even like play with, like, I don't even begin to play with like panel shapes that much. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I have a very strict grid. I'm very boring about my grid. 
I, I tend to stick with it so that when I do break it, it's exciting or interesting or like asking somebody like, take a moment, take a look at what's happening here. Mm -hmm. But like, even with somebody who has a very like strict grid, there's still so much you can do. Um, yeah. So yeah, time noise, um, or rather silence. I don't know. Um, these are some of my favorite things to do. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. love that. Um, so I'm curious about what has your creative attention at the moment. And then I always like to ask about uh, as well, those places where people can go, where they can learn more and, and see more about your work. Um, my creative attention right now is entirely dominated by my new book that's coming out. <laughs> um, it's unfortunately untitled. Um, I have like a few titles in the works, but like, I'd hate to say the title that it doesn't end up being, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's my new book coming out with little Brown, um, a lot TBD, but I'm basically in the final stages of like finalizing the final um files art files um and yeah it's absolutely dominated my attention for the past several years i am wildly behind schedule but not because i have been focusing on anything else but this book it's just taken so long but it's another ya book you know passports ya and this mm -hmm. is also ya but it's not um it's not memoir unlike passport which was all about my childhood um, growing up overseas, this is a fictional, you know, um, a fictional story, um, with, so yeah, YA fiction with some fantastical elements while still being very grounded in, in a reality that we can all sort of mostly agree on. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, looking forward to that. And yeah, yeah the other part of that was where can we go to learn more? Oh, yes. Um, well, I do have a website. I'm the proud owner of sophiadraws.com. Um, I try and keep it updated, but it has like full length comics on it um, and pretty art and all my New Yorker co cartoons in one place, all organized. Otherwise, like I'm probably not the most aggressively aggressive updater on that um, platform. But, you know, I like I'm still an Instagram girl. Um, it's still my favorite for showing pictures of. Um, of my work. I think it's still the most friendly towards artists, even though it wants us to be TikTok. Um, <laughs> I'm still, I still refuse. Um, we'll see how long that lasts. I don't know, but you know, it's for me, it's still like the safest place to share a funny joke or <laughs> a gag or a pun or a clip or, you know, yeah. So Instagram is always fun. Yeah. I agree. And I'm agree. Sophia draws daily there. Fantastic. It's, it's like a little art gallery. All yeah, yeah yeah it's the uh the moving portfolio yeah yeah well did i mention or did i miss anything that you'd like to mention i, I didn't even tap into the fact that passport is a memoir um, yes yeah. yeah so anything that you'd like to share about that process before we close out um yeah that was uh it was definitely interesting because i i do think that my you know the the, the literature i consumed as a child was like Border, you know, it's a lot of fairy tale and fantastical stuff. Um, my early comics when I started, you know, writing comics seriously, you know, deformatory and onward, you know, very, I did a lot of surreal stuff. Mm -hmm. I love surrealism and I still love fairy tales. Um, so I made a lot of surrealist fairy tales. Mm -hmm. So memoir was a very like, like a, you know, big shift towards, um, nonfiction, but the truth was that my shorter comics were getting like more and more and more personal, like underneath, you know. So even though I was like focusing on my long form work was fairy tale driven, I was doing all these like shorter pieces that were about feelings and families, and um. So yeah, so it was hard to talk about myself mm -hmm. in a way that, yeah, it was difficult to like actually put myself out there honestly yeah. um and i am relieved to sort of be back in the world of fiction because i feel safer behind these characters you know because not that anybody came for me when it was nonfiction, <laughs> but like you know i don't know it's a it's a there's a soft underbelly of truth telling there you know that um and i and i don't know i wonder if i'll ever write memoir again but it was 
it was fascinating. I'm very proud of it, you know, but yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see if there's more memoir because it was, it was hard. It was not easy. Yeah. I even talked to somebody recently who was like, is there such a thing as ethical memoir? And I think it's a decent question to ask yourself mm -hmm. when you're honestly, when you're thinking about writing it and when you're consuming it. Yeah. 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 That idea of full disclosure and even memory. Memory is such an interesting tool to try to work with. Yeah, it was a really, it kind of messed with my head to realize I could have told the story about eight different truthful ways and they could have all been very, very different. Yeah. I could have, you know, pressed harder on certain relationships, certain themes, certain tones, and they would have all been true. Yeah. And they could have all been radically different stories. Yeah. It's... It's a labyrinth. It's, yes. <laughs> Two Borges for me. No, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Oh, well, well, Sophia, I greatly appreciate the time. I appreciate your work. And I am looking forward to TBD as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I cannot wait to share it because I've been living with it so long. It needs a title. It needs a cover. Yes. It, needs, <laughs> it needs a shelf. <laughs> and then you're welcome to come on and talk about it when it's out. Yeah, that would be brilliant. And uh, thank you. Also, I appreciate your work as well. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, glad to have you back anytime. And thanks again. Yeah. Have a great day. You too.